a warm welcome to my session today. Today's online surgery clinics will discuss a short case followed by a short talk on perianal abscess, which is a very common condition and is an important subject for exams. Let's now go through the case history of a man with an anal problem. This is a 28-year-old man who presents to the emergency department complaining of an anal and lower back pain and fever for three days. He has tried taking simple analgesics with no benefit. The pain is progressively getting worse and is now finding it uncomfortable to walk or sit. He is otherwise fit and well. On examination, he is found to be febrile with a temperature of 38.2 degrees Celsius. An inspection of the inner reveals a 3 by 3 centimeter swelling at the inner margin at around the 4 o'clock position. The swelling is warm, exquisitely tender and fluctuant. There are no other abnormalities in the patient. Okay, as you ponder over this question or in, over this case scenario and the questions that follow, we shall come back to this question at the end of our presentation. What is an anorectal abscess? An anorectal abscess refers to a collection of pus in and around the anal and rectal region. It is a superficial infection that appears as a tender red lump under and near the anus. It is often also known as perianal abscess, although perianal abscess is in fact the most common variation of an anorectal abscess. These abscesses are common in men than in women and have a high rate of recurrence even after repeated treatment. Perianal abscesses are described their location in the perineum around the anus in resembling the face of a clock. Okay, 12, 3, 6 and 9 o'clock positions. With the patient in the lithotomy position, this is anterior which is 12 o'clock position and posterior is 6 o'clock position. This is a picture of a position, the patient with a perianal abscess. Okay, this is the anus. This is 12 o'clock and this is 6 o'clock. So this is around 10 to 11 o'clock position, the location of the abscess around the anus. Okay, this slide shows the anatomy of the anal canal. The anal canal, which is the continuation of the rectum, measures around 5 to 6 centimeters in length. The upper two-thirds are lined by columnar epithelium and, and on examination it looks red in color. The distal one-third lined by squamous epithelium and appears pale in color. The junction between these upper two-thirds and lower one-third is known as the dentate line. And this dentate line corresponds to the location of this vertical longitudinal mucosal folds known as columns of morgagni. The wall of the anal canal consists of the external sphincter and an internal sphincter, both circular muscles. The internal sphincter is a smooth muscle and the external sphincter is a voluntary muscle. In between is the intersphincteric plane which also carries fibers of the longitudinal muscle. At the same time, this is the location of the anal glands. And these anal glands located between these mucosal folds drain their secretions through their ducts into spaces in, in the crypts at the base of these mucosal folds. The foci of infection of a perianal abscess begins in the perianal glands or anal glands and spread along which are located along the dentate line. From here the abscess spreads to in all directions and produces the various types of 
abscesses. Next we come to the pathophysiology of anorectal abscess. Anorectal abscess is believed to be caused by plugging of the anal ducts. Okay, it's a theory known as the cryptoglandular theory or Parkes cryptoglandular theory. Okay, as I said, the glands are located in the interspinteric area, and these glands, their ducts gets blocked by feces or infected material, and this causes fluid stasis, leading to infection and formation of an abscess. The organisms that are mainly involved in this uh, infection are E. coli, Bacteroides species, Enterococcus species, and also bacteria from the skin such as Staphylococcus. The intersphinteric gland infection forms pus, and this pus tends to spread either caudally to form the perianal abscess, laterally across the lateral sphincter to form the ischiorectal abscess, and superiorly to form the supralevator abscess. And medially, sometimes it can form the submucous abscess. And circumferentially, the site of origin is the intersphinteric region, and that is the intersphinteric abscess. Okay, this uh, slide shows you the uh, origin of the inter, uh, perianal abscess, which starts in the interspinteric space here. Okay, so these are the anal glands. Okay, they are ducts empty into the crypts, which collect at the base of these columns, from where it is the secretions are secreted into this anal canal for the lubrication of the easy passage of stools. From here, this abscess, interspinteric abscess, can spread downwards to the surface, and this is the external uh, spinteric area, and this is known as the perianal abscess or superficial abscess. Then you have the ischiorectal abscess here, supraelevator abscess, and your submucous abscess. And the classification of these abscesses are as shown here. Okay, this is a clearer diagram. The interspinteric abscess, the origin of a perianal abscess. It goes medially and superficial, and this is your perianal abscess. Laterally across the sphincters, this is the ischiorectal abscess. Superiorly into the the supralevator space, intramuscular abscess, and also sometimes a submucous abscess. This slide shows you the incidence of the various types of abscesses that we see. Okay, the perianal abscess or the superficial abscess is about 60% of the cases, whereas ischiorectal abscess contributes to 20%, and together they form 80% of the abscesses. The others are the intersphinteric 5%, supralevator 4%, and submucous 1%. Okay, this is shown in this diagram clearly here. The superficial abscess or perianal abscess 60%, and the ischiorectal abscess 20%, and your intersphinteric abscess here is 5%. What are the causes of perianal abscess? The causes of the perianal abscess in the vast majority of cases is primary or idiopathic. Okay, we are not sure what really causes the abscess. Uh, the most believed or accepted theory is the cryptoglandular theory of Park, which I explained just now. Then secondary abscesses are much rarer, and important causes should be neoplasms of the rectum and anus, chronic inflammatory disease, especially Crohn's and ulcerative, especially Crohn's disease. In some cases, they are predisposed to these abscesses due to immunodeficiency diseases, especially diabetes 
HIV, and patients on steroid therapy. Trauma leading to hematoma of the perianal region can lead to infected hematoma and abscess formation. And lastly, fistula in ANO. I put it in bold letters here because there's a very uh, perianal abscesses are very closely related to fistula and ANO. Most of the abscesses lead to fistula and ANO, and fistula and ANO can com be complicated with by an abscess. As I said, the organisms involved will be the E. coli, bacteroides, enterococcus, and staphylococcus, and especially lately reported is the MRSA, methicillin resistant staphylococcus. Okay, what are the clinical features of perianal abscess? Eh? The perianal abscess, a number of clinical features in the history, you know, pain or pain around the anus. Eh? This is the most common symptom of the patient. And the pain is usually dull and very sharp pain. It is throbbing in nature and is very severe, excruciating pain. Okay, so much so the patient will not be able to sit or lie down with, uh, supine or flat. This is usually associated with chills and rigors, at times constipation due to pain and sepsis. In some patients, they have difficulty in passing urine. Sometimes, especially in male patients, they can have acute retention of urine. And they are unable to sit up or lie flat in the pain due to severe pain. On examination, they will have a swelling, a perianal swelling, which is very tender, like in this patient. And then the surface overlying, uh, skin overlying this tender lump will be very erythematous and fluctuant, indicating it contains pus. At times, at times, there can be frank discharge of pus with or without staining of blood. There is rarely very profuse bleeding uh, due to perianal abscess. Okay, this is the picture showing you a perianal abscess here, tense uh, globular swelling, which is palpable and very tender. Okay, at times, the site of the abscess may be revealed by the types of symptoms the patients present. The superficial perianal abscesses tend to be a severe perianal pain, sometimes discharge of pus and fever. And usually the tender, fluctuant and erythematous subcutaneous lump is usually visible on inspection. The ischiorectal abscess, they are slightly high, uh, deeper in location. They may have chills, rigors and ischiorectal pain. Patients still complain of severe pain in, around the anus. And, but the induration and erythema, the mass, are much less prominent compared to a perianal abscess. Okay? There is marked tenderness, but not as prominent. The swelling is not so prominent. In the interspinteric and the supralevator, which are much higher and deeper in location, there is severe rectal pain associated chills and rigors at times with discharge of pus. And when you do a digital examination, there's very marked tenderness. And uh, externally, there don't seem to be much, much signs to indicate the presence of an abscess. And these patients usually end up requiring an examination under anesthesia to locate the abscess. Okay, these are some pictures. This is picture showing you a small early abscess, perianal abscess at the two o'clock position. Okay, here there's a more severe abscess here, three o'clock position with massive cellulitis, huh? kind of complication, spreading cellulitis. Okay, if not treated, it can end up as other complications. Huh? Here again, a larger abscess here. Okay, this is a ischiorectal abscess, deep, slightly more deep seated. These are late signs. Normally, early signs they don't get much redness and swelling. 
this is a partially ruptured abscess at the 2 o'clock or 1 o'clock position. This is a 10 o'clock position abscess and another abscess here at 4 o'clock position. Okay, next we come to investigations for perianal abscess. Eh? Most perianal abscesses which are superficial do not really require any special investigations. They are usually quite clinical examination is sufficient to come to a diagnosis. However, a full blood count should be done which will show a leukocytosis and a blood sugar must be done for most patients because in a certain percentage of patients, especially the younger patients, uh, abscess, perianal abscess may be the first uh, indication of an diabetes mellitus. Examination of uh, under anesthesia is usually done for deeper abscesses where they do not have any obvious signs of perianal abscess other than digital uh, uh, tenderness on digital examination. Okay, these patients may end up requiring an uh, examination under anesthesia. Abscesses complicated with other conditions, especially fistula and eno, or unclear diagnosis or chronic, then they may need additional investigations like CT scan, MRI and fistulogram. However, I must emphasize in most cases, they need careful rectal examination with a proctoscopy or sigmoidoscopy is all that may be required. Now coming to complications of uh, anorectal abscesses, cellulitis, which I showed you just now, there's diffuse spreading cellulitis, and in diabetes patients, these are very, uh, these can be very serious and end up with necrotizing fasciitis, where the inf inflammation extends from the skin to the subcutaneous tissue, causing massive necrosis of the subcutaneous tissue and fascia. This can then proceed to phonious gangrene where there's massive gangrene of the subcutaneous tissue, fascia and as a result, this is known as phonious gangrene which is a very serious complication of perianal abscess and it is more common especially in patients who are immunosuppressed and especially in diabetic patients and this can easily turn to go into septicemia and shock. The very most common core complication is fistula in ANO, which results in recurrent attacks of perianal abscess and chronic abscesses. Okay, this slide showing you the complications, huh? various types of fistula in ANO can result as a result of the abscess rupturing into the rectum. Uh, anal canal as well as outside, so leading to fistula formation. Now, how do you manage these patients with perianal abscess? First of all, the most important symptom uh, as you see in this patient is very severe pain and tenderness. So you must give them adequate analgesia and most of these patients will require opiate, especially such as morphine. Intravenous, intravenously. Secondly, adequate antibiotic therapy to cover the gram-negative organisms as well as the anaerobic organisms. And these medications include metronidazole plus a cephalosporin or a quinolone. Thirdly, a UNA examination of anesthesia and followed by proctoscopy and flexible sigmoidoscopy is usually undertaken to rule out anorectal malignancies or inflammatory bowel disease, followed by an incision and drainage done under general anesthesia. Okay, And this is very, very important. Eh? The incision and drainage must be adequate, cruciate incision and breaking up of the uh, loculations within the abscess cavity to reduce the chance of recurrence. Dressing of the wound is very very important. The wounds must be carefully packed with antiseptics like Usol or Povidone 
and this wound dressing has to be carried out in the post-op period with great uh, care and uh, elaboration. Cyst bath is another important mechanism, another method to enhance the healing and reduce the pain and swelling of the patient. The wound is usually allowed to heal by secondary intention. Regular dressing and follow-up is very, very important. And these are all go a great long way to re reduce the recurrence of the abscess. Okay, this is a diagram showing you the past discharge from an internal abscess. Okay, these are the post-operative uh, procedures that are done for the patient. Debridement, toilet and wound until the wound becomes clean and healing and uh, the usual packing of the wound. This packing is to prevent the ulcer from closing before the wound is properly healed. Uh, the deeper part of the wound is closely healed. The aim is to allow the wound to heal from underneath slowly by second in that intention. The other important method is to have a sitz bath. There has a basin here. The patient who sits with postoperatively sits in this solution here, and this solution is normally normal saline or magnesium salt solution. Okay, this will allow the cleansing of the wound, reducing the edema, and therefore the infection and pain becomes uh, relieved, and the patient feels more comfortable, and it helps to heal the wound much faster. This is the original method, the mechanism of sitting into a bath. But nowadays we have got better methods, better gadgets eh, where you can sit on the, place it on the toilet bowl and even flush it. Use, and this can use normal saline to flush the wound to enhance the healing. This is done after the operation once or twice or three times a day depending on the severity of the wound. Okay, these are, this is the before the operation. Af after the IND, there's a wound which is healing, which is improving. The cellulitis have decreased compared here, and the wound is on the way to granulating and healing. This, the wound is almost closing up. Already the gap is being closed. Now, uh, wait for the no more packing, just do superficial dressing, and the wound gets closed. Okay, so allowing the wound to heal by secondary intention from beneath outwards. Okay, the key points to take home from this today's lecture. First is to anorectal abscesses are caused by blockage of the anal ducts, resulting in stasis and bacterial floral overgrowth and abscess formation. Diagnosis is Typically clinical, digital examination and proctoscopy, and sometimes sigmoidoscopy. However, MRI and CT or fistulogram may be required for complicated cases, or if especially complicated with fistula and anal. High risk for complications and sepsis, especially in diabetics and patients who are immunosuppressed. Okay, this is very important, you must bear in mind. And these patients with high risk must be treated very aggressively. Antibiotics, early drainage and aggressive dressing. The main complication is fistula and ano and recurrent abscesses. These are very notorious problems of very anal abscesses. Management is via EUA and incision and drainage. Drain all the pus, break down all the loc uh, loculations, followed by proctoscopy and, if necessary, sigmoidoscopy to rule out rectal cancers. And allow the wound to heal secondary intention. Huh? By secondary inten in, uh, intention and wound dressing, it's very important to prevent the recurrence of the arch abscess. Okay, now we come back to the clinical case that we saw earlier. 
Okay, so the patient has the history and examination from the history and examination. We realize from the history that severe pain, perianal pain, and fever. On examination, there is fever, anal swelling, and severe and fluctuant. So from these two conditions, from the history and the physical finding, the diagnosis is obvious. There is no need for further sophisticated investigations. Okay, the diagnosis is a perianal abscess. And these patients may need a AUA followed by incision and drainage. AUA to decide the, the type of abscess, the level of the abscess, the depth of abscess, eh? then appropriate drainage of the abscess. So these are the questions which we can answer one at a time. What is the diagnosis? It's very obvious, very anal abscess or any rectal abscess. What are the etiological factors associated with this condition? Okay, idiopathic in the vast majority, the cryptoglandular theory, Crohn's disease, anorectal carcinoma, anal fissure, anal trauma or surgery, pelvic abscesses may arise secondary to inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or diverticular disease. How are these lesions anatomically classified? Perianal or superficial, ischiorectal, interspintery, and supralevator. What is the treatment for this patient? Antibiotics, analgesics, examination of anesthesia under anesthesia, followed by incision and drainage, and after the drainage, postoperatively uh, aggressive or frequent dressings and debridement until the wound heals by secondary intention. Okay, this is uh, the end of my talk for today. I, as I leave you with a small quotation in medicine. 